Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by British folk singer and traditional music specialist. My guest has become recognised for his dedication and work in collecting, restoring and sharing ancient music from Britain and Ireland. His debut album, Ground of Its Own, was shortlisted for the 2012 Mercury Music Award. He's the creator and manager of the folk music promotional network, The Nest Collective, which hosts folk music events. A very warm Your Take welcome to Sam Lee, who talks about his life, his music, and his love for traditional music forms and the communities who performed and shared this style of music. Wednesday morning, 1st first, first of December, thank you for joining me. Thanks, James. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. How are you? You well? Very well, thank you. It's a sunny day. Happy to be here. It's interesting. You kind of join various guests we've had on the on your take who've been involved in music, mainly musicians. And I kind of felt very much in my comfort zone because they've been kind of roots music performers or performing popular music. And I kind of being a music enthusiast, I kind of felt I've very much known about those kind of forms of music. I kind of feel today it's going to be very much a learning curve for me. And I'm kind of fascinated to hear about traditional music forms and where they come from. But initially, I thought we go back to the very beginning. I kind of wanted to find out a little bit about your background and go back to the early part of the 1980s. You were born in... 1980 and grew up in northwest London and I kind of wanted to just ask your memories of childhood and just paint a little bit of a portrait of who your parents are and if you have any brothers or sisters. Yeah I well I have two sisters two younger sisters um mum and dad both still living in northwest London um very kind of unique but also good home um, with some fairly characterful mum and dad. Dad is a, um, an, a writer and artist and, and uh, graphic designer. <coughs> and my mum, well, she was a mum, but she was also a speech therapist, worked for the Stroke Association, worked in education. Mm. So many different jobs, but always uh, organisations that were about helping people. Um, supporting um, and our home was always filled with waifs and strays and people staying over fill, fill, filled with people and gatherings it was a very social place lots of cheer uh, in, intense articulate debating and um, yeah so a, 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 an interesting environment and northwest London being <clears throat> a wild nether region in the 80s, uh, tough, very tough, very, very dangerous bit of London, um, which has become really nice and smart now, but was not the case growing up, quite a terrifying place sometimes, but also really exciting. It was right next to Camden Town, which as a teenager was an amazing place to go and hang out in and be uh, introduced to the, uh, the alternative ways of the world. You've given us a little bit of background about family life and where you came from, but I kind of wanted to just move on to your, your school in your academia. Where did you go to school? And then I kind of want to move on and talk about you studying at the Chelsea College of Art. I kind of just want to find out what you gained from that time and experience there. Yeah. Well, I went to school locally and then up in North London and it was school was not my happy place uh I didn't thrive there uh I wasn't a social kid I was very uh I was very bullied at school um and so I retreated into my own worlds and kept a very strong distance between myself and academia and that institution 
um, my I was very dyslexic as well and very artistic and that didn't sort of sit well within the places I was so I sort of got on with my own life and wasn't willing to compromise and try and fit in uh, and be something else for the sake of fitting in so I uh, so come you know age 17 18 I was really kind of hid away in the art department and painted and drew and created and learned about art and then made it through into the art school system first Camberwell College and then into Chelsea College of Art which was just havens of alternative diversity and uh, creativity and, and all the other wastes and strays and uh, people who didn't quite fit into their uh, you know system gathered together as these all yeah these alternates and uh, we you know we got on really well and there was a real sense of that exciting creative energy and being in the thick of London as well which was my home was a really really wonderful place to be I didn't really need to leave London to kind of get away from my life I could just go to a different part of London and be a different sort of Londoner mm. um, so it was yeah I'm very grateful to my art school for teaching me um, allow me to get very much into my nature work as well and um, explore ingenuity and um, and my senses of of you know what my relationship to the world is. I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that we've had a number of musicians on the the program and it's become quite music led. But interestingly, when I asked them the question about where they first discovered and performed music and their influences, they tend to very much cite the the same influences from kind of the, the Beatles to the Stones and early rock and roll and so on, because many of them are kind of popular music performers or performing roots music. I kind of wanted to hear your story about how you kind of discovered this kind of wonderful music and its history, uh, traditional music forms, ancient music and folk. How did, how did you come across that music and what was it about that? music that you became so kind of passionate about it mm. well it didn't really come to me quite so forcefully until I was in my mid-20s um I I was a a great consumer of music obsessive record collector uh and obsessed with several artists who, you know who I devoted my life and fascination towards but the um but the folk song, although I'd sort of grown up with it a little bit as a child in, in an organisation I had um, been lucky enough to be sent off to on some for summer camps called Forest School Camps, a sort of like radical left-wing scouts movement, um, much more alternative, much more free thinking and edgy. Uh, and we had a great campfire song tradition of which there was quite a bit of folk music in there, but I didn't know it was folk music. I just fact I didn't know what the song where the songs came from I got a sense of them being old but what does old mean to a kind of 13 year old you know it doesn't really kind of you know it doesn't hold the same concept of ancient uh and I'd grown up singing these songs and really loved them and then age 20 mid-20s was like oh, I want to go and find out more about these songs because no, none of my art school friends or anybody seems to know about these songs they're just completely absent from anywhere in the contemporary world mm. um, and the internet was just coming about so I started you know searching online and before I knew it, I was finding versions of these songs sung by contemporary folk singers and that really startled me because here was the songs that I loved but being sung professionally in a, on records and you know and, and it was they were really attractive but also at the same time they kind of like, they weren't exactly how I felt they should be. They didn't quite make sense. And then I realized from reading the liner notes that they had been learned in turn from old field recordings or from the mouths of old singers who were the, you know, the farmers, the fishermen, the gypsies, the travelers, the milkmaids, the sort of the working class, you know, the, the, the people of the country. Uh, who just knew these songs they've been passed these songs down from generation to generation and when I discovered this that there was a sort of root music 
like the blues, you know, in that mm. sort of way. I was like, holy crap. You know, like Britain has its own indigenous music. And I've been listening to tribal music from around the world. I've loved Smithsonian Folkways records, avidly collected their LPs of, you know, Eskimo, Inuit, Inuit music, uh, Navajo songs, um, Sephardic folk songs, you know, North African, Azerbaijani, you know, I was listening to traditional music from all around the world. I loved it, absolutely loved it. And then to find out we had treasure on our own doorstep was just like, of course we do, but why have I never heard it before? Why is it so invisible? And that was it. That was like, that got me. I was like, this is what I want to work. This is the stuff. This is my raw ingredients. It's like the artist finding the box of paints that they just like the color palette that they're like, that's it forever after I'm going to be working with these ochres. Um, and so uh, I, so I fell down the well of, of traditional British folk song, took all other music out of my diet, listened only to folk music to the old recordings, not the revival at all. Mm. Like that, that offered, that held no interest to me at all. It was a momentary like, ah, it was a stepping stone back so that I could get to the source and then from the source, work my way into the present. From the discovery of the music, it seems to me that if we go back to 2008, this kind of seems a significant point in, in your life because you met folk singer Stanley Robertson who took you on as a, a student and apprentice teaching mm. you many of his songs and introducing you I'd imagine to kind of other forms of music as well how did you meet and how much of a, a mentor was he and what did you le learn musically from his tutorage? Mm. So Stanley Robertson, just to kind of give an idea of who he is and how, how he fits in, I should probably say that in my research and listening to all these old recordings, I met lots of the academics and folklorists and librarians and all the people, the old men, mostly all old men, white men, uh, lovely people who all told me that those old source singers, as we call them, these old wisdom carriers of the tradition, song carriers, they'd all dead and gone. There were none left. All that music from that generation, those times had been recorded and passed on. Um, and I didn't believe this. I was like, surely, surely there's got to be some people still alive who sing the songs within f coming from an unbroken tradition. And then in comes Stanley Robertson, who is not only of the Robertson family, Scottish traveler, I, uh, ancient people um, of northeast Scotland of Aberdeen who I knew from recordings because his aunt Jeannie was one of the most fam famous folk singers that was ever recorded people came from all over the world to hear her sing Lomax came over to the UK and recorded her many times and albums of her music put out by Anne Lomax and, and other Scottish song collectors um, and British song collectors she was a much celebrated carrier of thousands of songs and was part of the Robertson clan, the Scottish travellers who were the great keepers of ancient song on a level like nowhere else, you know, on a level equivalent to a African griots carrying thousands of years of, of lineage and heritage. And, and Jeannie was no different in her breadth of repertoire and knowledge of Scottish history and knowledge of the land and all those sorts of things that one expects from a, an indigenous people, an indigenous people, a traditional, mm. un, you know, community not changed that much over the centuries. And Stanley was the last in that family to be alive and have inherited the songs and the culture. He also happened to be an exceptionally gifted singer, storyteller, Piper and clairvoyant psychic um, and uh, very much in touch with the ancient world in that way that we don't see anywhere. Um, we can't imagine what that's like, but once upon a time, everyone lived with a certain level of attunement as Stanley had to a very, which was a very high degree. And we met in Whitby at a folk festival. I thought he was dead. I'd heard his recordings. I'd learned his songs. 
I assumed he'd passed on like everyone else. And when I met him, it was like, ah, oh, that's Stanley Robertson. And he knew who I was, not because I was famous, because I wasn't. I was a 28 year old who'd never been to a folk festival before. I was a complete newbie in town, but he knew who I was, uh, knew who, what my journey was, knew everything about me in the way that psychics know, knew that I was coming into his life um, and uh, instantly it was like, and there's a much longer story which we won't tell now because it takes a long time of the extraordinariness and the serendipity and the, uh, the circumstances under which we met, which were almost Tolkien-esque. Um, but that's what happened. And he uh, took me on as his tutor and I went up to Aberdeen many times and he'd come down to London and to the South occasionally. and. I would sit at his knee essentially and learn his songs and we'd go out into the Aberdeenshire lands and look at where the songs had come from. Songs that go back, you know, 400 years, 800 years, a thousand years. And, where? and look at their lineage and where, and also what it meant to sing, which was something I'd never really quite understood. Singing was like about becoming a pop star to me and gaining a following and selling lots of records. For him, it was about a communication with an ancient world and a spiritual act. And he taught me that, most importantly. I want to move on and touch upon the work you've done, collecting, restoring and sharing ancient music. Uh, and you've mentioned the origins from Britain and Ireland. I wanted to ask you what challenges are involved in actually reworking these songs and coming up with and performing the music instrumentation? Mm. Well, that was... The, that is the, the my my next challenge and journey, which was, you know, it's all very well learning these songs as an unaccompanied singer, because that's how all these songs have only ever existed. Mm. Single, one singer, one song, no instrumentation, just a cappella. That's how British traditional song has been sung for thousands of years, even without harmony, with the exception of just one or two instances in history. So we're talking a very specific tradition here, which in many ways was great because like there was no preconceived way that it, things should sound. And the way that the folk revival had put guitars and fiddles and electric guitars eventually and, you know, created a very singular sound to the folk revival with a few exceptions of people who did things slightly differently. Um, I was like, mm, I want to do it my way. I want to make music that's, sounds the way I want to hear these songs that's taking them out of a very perceived acoustic environment and limitation and unshackle these songs because I felt a little bit like although the revival was has got some of the greatest musicians and amazing people who've carried this this these songs through the last 40 50 years there's also a bit of a musical straitjacket that's been put around this this material um, and I don't think it's really honoring ushering not honoring ushering them into the new sonic era that we live of contemporary music and incredible sound worlds yet I'm not a musician and I haven't got any clue on how to compose because I've never composed but hey I went to art school so I'll give it a go because that's what we do and uh, so I set about um, just just around the time that Stanley Robertson passed away which was you know, a great tragedy and loss, but also a bit of a gift for me to then go off and start to be creative with his songs and other songs. It was like, okay, let's start experimenting and let's use my art school process of seeking and listening and those skills and also the skills that I'd learned from my nature work, working in the natural world, um, which has always been a massive part of my life. I, uh, yeah, I started to compose and I, won an award to, with some funding to make an album. And, um, and I eventually created my first album uh, with a wonderful producer, Jerry Diver, um, down in South London, a uh, wonderful Irish fiddler, Abbott experimentalist, and put that album out having no clue. Um, and uh, the rest of the day is history, you know. I want yeah. I want to move on in a minute and obviously talk in detail about the debut album released back in 2012. But before, I kind of wanted to stay on this theme of 
you performing this music and composing and giving kind of your take and your create creativity on it as well, your stamp on the music. Mm. But my, my question was, you've performed and reworked a number of songs that have come from Romany Gypsy and Irish Traveller communities. What kind of interests you about that particular music and what's your knowledge on it of its origins and how it's performed today? Well, there's many massive questions there because I mean, in one respect, I was I determined to become a creative. I was creative. I wanted to make music. I wanted to have a performing career. I wanted to bring this music to a contemporary audience, <clears throat> particularly an audience who'd never heard folk music. For me, that was the main ambition. I wasn't interested in preaching to the choir at all. Uh, but at the same time, I was aware that I wasn't satisfied in just learning songs from recordings. Um, I've always what stood by the quote from Gustav Mahler that tradition is tending the flame and not worshipping the ashes. And that's been a deeply inspiring quote that I can't just pick up the old books and like rehash them and make it sound a little bit like, you know, that's not for me progress. Mm. That's, 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 you know, that's preservation and that's not conservation. Um, and I, so I was like, I want to go out into the field. I want to go and find songs. And it became quite clear through a colleague of Alan Lomax's, who I managed to spend some time with before he passed away, Peter Kennedy, who was the great British equivalent to Alan Lomax, that there was possibly songs still out there within the uh, Irish traveller and English gypsy, who, like the Scottish travellers, were the nomadic ancient people of this, these islands. Uh, and still lived a very secretive and um, hidden away life. So I decided that for me to learn my songs, I had to go and find them myself. And uh, I wanted to go and meet the elders, the other Stanley Robertsons who were, unlike Stanley, he was a very well-known character. So I went off in my car and I went pulled off on the side of motorways to traveler sites and gypsy halting sites and traveled all around Ireland many many times spent weeks and weeks on end just foraging for songs and going meeting incredible people and finding these last of the ancient world uh elders in their 70s and 80s and 90s who knew songs and knew the life of an older way that was this had long since disappeared and had the great privilege to record and document and step into the footsteps of the, the old field co song collectors uh, field recordists and meet some amazing people and yeah it was to record so that I could hold their repertoire and their stories in for posterity but also for my own sense of um, intimate exchange with them that uh, go and show them a sense of respect and value for what they've been carrying because these were hard living people who'd had hard lives and had been generally treated really badly by society particularly the settled, settled community there was, you know, endemic racism, appalling levels of, you know, healthcare and education that had not had no that where there was no access to that. So a tough people who'd been given a raw deal in life. So for me as an outsider to come in and listen and give them my time and listen, I felt was a really important gesture and to show that there was interest for what is essentially their only inheritance that they leave, and nobody was really in their community was paying attention to. So I recorded thousands of songs from hundreds of singers, which is all online at the songcollectors.org uh, website where I've made it digitally available. And I started to work with those songs to try and bring them to life in a new way, give them a new lease of life, reupholster them as I, as I call it, uh, and radically change them, but bring a whole sound world to them in my future albums. We touched on briefly the debut album, Ground of mm. Its Own, and you said after the release and the, the critical reaction and the success of it, you did say kind of the rest was history. But I just want to talk about the process of actually creating the album and the songs featured on the album and also kind of the, the reaction to it. Mm. Well, um there are a couple of bits of advice I got from my father before I started releasing 
and one was um, remember with all the attention you get, don't inhale. <laughs> uh, uh, and and the other bit of advice actually wasn't from my dad, but we we laughed about it was that a compliment from the critics is like the hangman saying you have a pretty neck. <laughs> I no matter how good it is, they're gonna lynch you at some point for something when they get a chance. <laughs> Whoever the they is, not just the critics, not just like the press, but you know. So I've always sort of appreciated the praise and the attention, but I have um, I've always thought that felt it kind of rather sort of titillatory and nothing more and not actually anything to do with keeping me in service to what I'm really interested in which is uh, about the maintenance of a, an extraordinary in, uh, local heritage that plays more than just a role as being a quaint little sort of like antique on our mantelpiece going mm. oh that was granny's old chamber pot you know it's about this is something that speaks about our connection to our ancestors which is undervalued and is actually essential and I don't mean essential as a kind of like like having milk in the fridge essential as in it's part of what keeps us human in a time when being a human is a very very complex and sensitive thing and uh, may not be possible for much longer. And the, the collapse in society that we're experiencing, and I'm getting big, and this is where I go into the environmental world that I'm actually mostly in service to now, um, and the problems that we're facing within, within environmental, the environmental climate and social justice issues are all consequences of, of us having stepped away from a more connected and fulfilled way of life in pursuit of a, uh, a, a rampant capitalist consumerist society, which is slowly, no, not slowly, very fast cannibalizing our culture. And folk music offers a glimpse of, of a way things once have been, but also um, a blueprint to how we can be as people, i.e. more community driven, more locally driven, yet also global at the same time, and more in touch with our families and our sense of heritage and responsibility to one another. And that's all inherent within folk music. And I realized that actually this is a material, it's not just pretty songs with nice tunes that I can make a few bucks off by gigging. It's actually wise shit that we need to listen to and start paying attention to. I wanted to pick up on a couple of your comments um, at the beginning of that question, when you mentioned about critical reaction to, to music, the music press and so on, because it kind of leads on nicely to my next question. And that was, what was your kind of initial reaction when you were shortlisted for the Mercury Music Award for the debut album? And what was the overall experience like of actually attending the the award ceremony um oh it was great you know i was like over the moon of course i was you know i was i was 31 or 32 you know and i was like i want to be a musician and you know within a few years i'd gone from like naught to 60 mm. and suddenly <clears throat> here i was working in a really like uncool niche music I was like the nerdy kid at school as it were who's suddenly like you know head of the prom whatever it, it, it was that kind of like moment of like ah oh, limelight attention and I love it of course I do I have an ego and I'm uh, but I'm also totally aware of that like okay I've got their attention now I can talk about the things that are really important to me it wasn't like oh now I can talk about myself and how wonderful I am. <laughs> it was about like, right, folk music's in the spotlight. It's not about me, it's about folk music. And I didn't really know what folk music was <clears throat> then. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't think I know what it is about now. I'm still trying to find that out. I wanted to 
different I in 10 years. To pick up on something here, you said it was a lovely moment to be in the spotlight. And we all, I guess, as males have mm. egos and we all want to hear complimentary mm. comments and positivity. But as an artist who is particularly interested in the communities, the kind of message behind the, the music, the people who you say you invested a lot of time and in, in interest in, working communities who have very different lives to kind of, like you say, like a, a normal consumerist capitalist um, existence. Did part of you kind of worry as an artist that, you know, you were kind of selling out in a way because some bands go from, you know, it was all, it means all about the, the music and, you know, they're particularly keen on a certain type of music. And when they get big and they find that kind of mass appeal and that big audience, there's kind of a worry that actually we kind of, our purpose is now diminished in it, so to speak. Oh no, it was, I mean, I'm far too politically minded and I no, that was never even a question for me. It was about actually how can I how can I build as big an empire around the music? And it's not just about my music, the Nest Collective, my organization, which is about creating platforms for artists, about um, putting on concerts, about supporting the arts. It's like this is great, this is fuel, this is petrol on the fire. And what I knew is I had to do it in a sustained way that didn't blow the thing up. And it's not about selling out because that's about artistic, uh, artistic failure. You know, I actually, I did want to sell out. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a sellout artist. I wanted my art to be as listened to by as many people, but I, I was never driven to be like a, a star so I wasn't ever trying to make music I've only made like three albums anyway you know I've actually my artistic output is pretty small for the years I've been doing it if I'd been a sync a so you know an artist all the time I'd have made a lot more and I'd probably be somewhere else now um but my always when it came to making music my you know my teachers dead and alive hold me to account on making sure that the integrity of that music and those songs is maintained, if not enhanced. That I've never had any question on. And I feel like I'm a, I'm a steward and I know what my role is and I know when I'm doing it wrong. That's by my own standards. Other people will say my music is shit. It's ruined folk music. It's ugly. It's poncy. It's this or it's that. And I'll have many detractors, uh, but, I don't, I'm not interested in that. I don't care. I'm doing it for my sense of love and duty towards the, the tradition and the people I've learned the songs from. Um, and with also with a very, very acute sensitivity to the people who are going to be listening to it now and tomorrow, because that is so important that it is a music for now as well. And that mustn't be forgotten. I wanted to pick up on the Nest Collective that you have just mentioned. You're the creator and, and manager of it, but I wanted to find out when it was established and just tell us about some of the musicians you've showcased and the music events you've hosted over the years. Mm. Well, the Nest Collective is my, my baby. It's in many ways the thing that I'm proudest the most of. It's 16, nearly 17 years old. Um, we're going through a wonderful uh, um, chrysalis shedding time at the moment of entering into a, uh, a real visioning for the next five years. Um, having reached a staff team of about nine of us uh, who I employ um, of some incredible uh, pe music appreciators and administrators and uh, creating scenarios where music and nature can exist together, where the music can be taken out of the box and create experiences for listening to folk world, acoustic music, electronic music in sublime ways that are not always 
um, honoured in contemporary music world. We do a lot of concerts. We do have a summer series of about, we do about 100 shows a year, which include the Campfire Club. So all summer concerts around campfires in city centres, green spaces in city centres. And that's about five cities around the country. Um, the thing with Nightingales, my beautiful six weeks of ceremonies with me making music with, with musicians, with the Nightingale, this incredible bird in the forest. It, we produce Kayleys, we have a, a choir, a protest choir. We, um, uh, we do a twice annual festival called the Magpie's Nest. Uh, we do pilgrimages and nature walks and loads and lots of artistic development programs that help support emerging artists and also uh, mid-stage artists in understanding more about the nature uh, emergence and nature and ecological emergency. A lot of activism inherent within it. And it's a, a big community that's across the UK now of musicians and audiences who come for a particular quality of experience that feels very much like about bringing people together for community. So that's what The Nest is, and I'm deeply proud of it. And uh, we're entering into charitable status, which is very exciting. Um, and um, it's been, yeah, it's been my sort of way of keeping the half of folk music and community hot and alive, as opposed to just looking after myself. It's, it's my, yeah, it's where I put my time to, to make sure that the you know, a float, a rising tide floats all ships, as they say, and I think folk music needs as many platforms and opportunities as the generations of old folkies and listeners are literally dying away and folk clubs and, and concert venues are disappearing. The nest, particularly in time of COVID, is exploding because of the nature of being an outside experience. We can pr provide music in safe uh, and really like aesthetically beautiful ways. So it's become a, you know, a bit of a bit of a thing. I think this is a, a nice point to move on in terms of live music. Mm. Do you enjoy touring? And my question is, what do you do to occupy yourself when traveling from venue to venue? Um, I, I like touring, but not too much touring. I'm sure most artists will say that. I don't live for the for tours. I was quite happy for two years not to tour not to do gig at all in fact I was I, you know I have no like thirst for the stage but when I'm there I love it and and I'm good at it um but um what keeps me occupied on tour this I've just come off tour it's the first one since the beginning of pandemic and um I had an amazing time actually of uh, it's hard work a lot of traveling um, but we, as a band, make a real effort to take time out in nature, to walk, um, to spend time with friends in those cities who I don't get to see, um, and to actually take a time of real self-care. Um, except you... that actually I'm not very, pro I'm a prolific person when it comes to like output and activation you know, doing different projects. When I'm touring, I'm actually not that prolific. And it's a strange thing. I have to go into a place of accepting. I can't do that many emails. I can't do that many meetings. Um, so I have to go into a place of like, okay, actually I'm in service to the music for now. And that's really important. So that was what my touring has been like recently. Have you performed much outside of the UK? Mm. And I wanted to ask where you kind of enjoy performing the most and how do audience kind of react to your music outside of Britain and Ireland? Yeah. Well, I mean, Britain is, can be broken up into many different places and many different reactions. Uh, my, my income as an artist was almost predominantly from European and international touring and gigs. So uh, that's where I earned my money. Alas, that's not so easy anymore. I just came back from Finland a couple of weeks ago, which is my first international gig since uh, since just before pandemic. I was last international gig I played was actually in New Orleans, um, and I uh, I really miss Europe. Actually, like like really miss it. The treatment they give to artists there is second to none. 
we're treated like humans <laughs> we're, we're looked after we got we get paid very well um come to the uk it's really miserable treatment even a mid-level artist that i'm i mean i'm not a stadium filler um and you know the sort of places i go to even when i'm playing bigger stages you know i'm well aware that there's very little money to be made from the arts from gigging in the uk predominantly actually a lot of people you know have to work really hard and if you look at the kind of the pay for the amount of time you put into it after you've you know paid for hotels and a six-piece band it's like there's not much left over really um it's interesting you pick up on that i interviewed a guest quite recently who broke big kind of around the mid 2000s with uh, one album and she was telling me by the time she comes back from a uk tour She's lucky if she's broken even. And I was quite, I was quite surprised by that comment because mm. I thought there was quite big money in, in touring for an artist. No, alas not. Not in this country. We don't have subs enough subsidy for the arts. It comes down ultimately for subsidy because a lot of venues are, you know, are really tight on their budgets. I know about this because I do budgets for artists. I look at the financial structure of an organization that has a small amount of Arts Council funding. And, you know, although we always pay musicians union rate to our artists, it's not very often that you can <clears throat> start to pay much more. And we're in quite a nice financial situation because we don't have a venue to uphold and that sort of thing. Um, so it's really incredible about how the relationship towards endorsement and support for the arts exists in a culture in an individual basis you know if you do a route a pass the hat around in a house concert people think oh yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give five pounds you know ten pounds that's great you start if you break down the economics of being an artist it's like you 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 pay more for your plumber yet what does music bring to our lives we undervalue art, the arts so much because there's so much of it that's ubiquitous and because we've developed a very sort of sort of assumed relationship that it's going to be there and we deserve it. And actually, I think we as a national culture really have to kind of start to look at like, you know, what do we need at the most? We'll spend fortunes on a pair of fucking shoes yet for the experience of a soul nourishing concert will go oh god it's 14 pounds it's far too much money I, I just can't be bothered do you know what i mean it's like i i find it rather angering actually how people don't respect music in that way but then i see that same level of respect happening at so many other things particularly within the natural world of this just assumed it'll always be there and it'll be fine but actually what's happening in the music world is that it's an ecosystem in collapse and artists are giving up and the integrity of the arts and the ambition of the arts is not there because many people can't afford to do it anymore. Those that can that do do it can afford to do it because either they've had the privilege of, you know, financial support from somewhere or other, or they've been really lucky and had loads of success and have been paid. It's interesting that you make that comment because I used to work at a, a workplace which was in central Bristol and during my lunch break I would go to somewhere like HMV and I'd come back with like three or four CDs and some of my work colleagues would turn around and they'd say why do you want to buy albums these days and I said well a lot of effort was put into making writing these songs producing the album and I would rather yeah. pay pay the artist or the artists receive a contribution for me paying £10 for the album. And they'd say, well, you can get it all on Spotify for, for free. Why do you want to pay for something? So I totally agree with you with this undervaluation with creativity and people working in creative fields for voluntary or not being paid at all by employers. Like, I can totally agree with that. But I kind of wanted to, to move on and kind of pick up on the, the political side, because you've mentioned in the conversation that you're interested in politics, you're very much engaged in it. Do you feel as a, a performer, a musician, that you want to use the platform to kind of make some of your political views heard? 
And also, I kind of wanted to ask you, we've obviously had two years of the global pandemic. Were you hoping for a kind of quick shift in changes and, you know, changes to society? What's kind of been your observation of what's happened over the last two years? And would you like to see major change being brought about? Oh, well, of course, I'd like to see major change all about. And I'm seeing all the things that are failures in governmental uh, policy and behavior are playing out in the pandemic in their, um, in the injustice within it um, and the appalling abuse of the pandemic as a way of strengthening um, powers um, to uh, to uh, bring about, a, 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 how should I say this? I think the pandemic has been a, a, a wonderful example about how we're given an opportunity to really uh, explore how we as a world work and we've completely failed. The Omicron uh, variant, which is just emerging as we make this recording, mm. is a wonderful example of how the, the climate crisis like is just like the, the pandemic in that unless there's justice for everybody, there's no justice for anybody. Um, and because we haven't made sure, because the rich countries have made sure that we have vaccination programs that have kept us okay, what's happened is, is that South Africa or Botswana or other countries that have not had the finances to immunize their communities have been the breeding grounds for new variants which are going to come back and undermine all the hard work we're doing so we can do all and you can relate that to the climate crisis so easily in terms of we can do all the work to making sure that we as a society are doing all the right things although environmentally we're not we're actually making all the gestures but doing none of the all the talk and none of the walk but actually the environmental crisis is going to affect everybody and have deep impact on us as an island as a, as a country. So uh, pandemic could have been a great teacher, but actually it's been an exploited opportunity to divert uh, enormous amounts of finances into the pockets of the, the cronies and the institutions around. And a real revealing of how little the government actually cares about society and how good it is at rhetoric and gesture, but actually isn't very good at doing what's really needed and looking after people in the way that really, is really needed. You see that within the selling off of the NHS and changes that are going on there. All, you know, it's like, I'm so utterly sick of the British government. It's, it's just tragic. The, the more painful thing is watching a country lap it up <clears throat> and be completely oblivious to all of this and be completely fooled by the media, who are actually the ultimate culprits in this, in all these things. So I, you know, I am a political person. I'm not a political person. I'm not very agile and articulate in my politics. I'm much more interested in, in ecology and the relationship to the natural world and focusing in on that, because I think that's in many ways the biggest crisis that we have coming up ahead of us is the environmental and ecological crisis, which makes the pandemic look like a bit of, you know, a bit of a rash in comparison to what the impact it's gonna have on a longer term basis, but on a more permanent basis. Um, so that's where I feel that my attention is still focused towards and the pandemic has, you know, slowed that progress down, but also perhaps it's also maybe, um, sped us up a little bit in a closeness to actually what being fucked really looks like. <laughs> Sam Lee, we come to the final set of questions. These are questions we've asked all our Your Take guests. They're just quick questions just to find out what your pastimes are, things you like, maybe things you don't like so much. The first one is what is your favourite pastime? My favourite pastime I think would be swimming in rivers. We move on to cinema. What is your favourite film and why? Ah, uh, 
I always find it hard to pick mm. one. I've, I've probably got a list of about 20. Yeah. I, keep, I think I... I think I'm going to say this one. It's a French film. It's uh, based on the memoirs of Marcel Pagnol, Le Guard de Mon Père, Provence, turn of the century, 1900s, boys, boyhood growing up, going from the city into Provence. That's my favourite film. From, from films to novels, who is your favourite novelist? Right now, I'm going to say it's Robin Wall Kimmerer. Okay, if you could have chosen a different profession outside of music, what would it have been? Ethnobotanist. Who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Uh, it goes between three people. Michael Jackson, Joni Mitchell and my mother. Three good choices. Um, we've spoken and touched upon the, the media in this country, but do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, well, I read a few things. I do read The Guardian. Yeah. Which angers me more than it pleases me. <laughs> um, I sometimes read The Financial Times. Um, and I read The Week, which is a digest of all the newspapers, which is a, mag a weekly magazine. And that I really appreciate. From the from the press now to food, what is your favourite food? Uh, my favourite food is the humble courgette. Interested to hear your comment on this one. Who is your favourite cultural icon? I don't really believe in icons. I don't think. Yeah. Sorry, pass on that one. Is there any sort Oh, no, of... I'm going to say... I, I'll tell you who I'm going to say at the moment. Uh, who's a really good friend, but I just think she's fabulous. There's Lily Cole. <clears throat> Next one. What is your favourite curse word and why? Uh, it's not a curse word. It's the opposite. It's praise... Praise... Uh, praise word. Amazeballs. Amazeballs. And what's your favourite... Favourite place or holiday destination? Um, Sussex. This is an interesting one. Who is your favourite musical artist and also your favourite album of all time? Oh, uh, well, it's going to be Joni Mitchell and it's going to be Hissing of Summer Lawns. Interestingly, we have one guest who chose you as their favourite music artist. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was Natalie Fee, who's um, an environmentalist. So, yeah. Love Natalie. Um, yeah, oh, um, I praise, I'll send her this interview as well. Um, what's your greatest achievement She's a today? Icon. <laughs> Tell her that. Come I will on, do man. indeed, she'll love that, yeah. Uh, what's your greatest achievement today? Oh, my greatest achievement is the London Marathon. And lastly, Sam Lee, how do you wish to be remembered? Um, I wish to be remembered through song. A lovely way to end. I found it a fascinating, fascinating conversation. I said at the beginning, like I regard myself as a little bit of a music fan and like yourself, a, a collector. You can see some of my albums here, but I don't know anything about traditional music whatsoever before we spoke um, during the last 60 minutes. So it's been a great education, a great education for me. And I found it really intriguing. And your comments about society, political politics and so on. It's been a really interesting insight. So thank you kindly for taking part and being a guest on your take. Thanks for having me, James. And finally, what are your musical plans for the future? And how do we find out more about Sam Lee and any future touring gigs, uh, recordings and so on? The future is totally unknown. But if you want exclusive <laughs> first access to the future, follow me on at Sam Lee Song on Twitter and Instagram and, and uh, go onto my website, sign up to my mailing list.
um, and I'll tell you about all the magical things that I do. It's not just like this tour, this tour, this tour. There's lots of interesting things that I'll be sharing. So um, yeah, lots coming up next year as well. Some exciting things which I save, save till till they've they've manifested. That's incredible work, and keep up all the the work you've done to archive all this great kind of British history. Great, thanks, James. <laughs>